Welcome back. How effective has the Affordable Health Care Act been, and would repealing it do more harm than good? Joining us by Skype is Dr. Jay Wolfson, Associate Vice President of USF Health and Senior Associate Dean of the Morsani College of Medicine. Uh, doctor, uh, thank you so much for joining us. You know, it's very easy to say that there are problems with something, and certainly we have seen the, the rising premiums. It's, it's a, a lot more complicated to say why that is. Is that the difficulty that the Affordable Health Care Act has had? Uh, let's first distinguish the mandate component from the rest of the Affordable Care Act. You've got 2,000 pages of legislation, uh, 50,000, 100,000 pages of regulations, and the mandate portion relates to the benefits. There's a lot of other stuff in the Affordable Care Act that both sides of the political aisle agree upon. And that the mandate portion is what has created some of the difficulties because when it was created, the people who wrote the law said, it's flawed, we'll fix it later. There were actuarial issues, there were management issues, there were financing questions, and there were, as you know, mechanical questions simply accessing the web in order to get on. But all of those things resulted in a lot of, of, of scraped knees and, 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 and bad problems, including, as you noted a moment ago, uh, increases in premiums this year. Many people who purchase their benefits and are not subsidized have very high co-payments, which means that they may be paying two, three, five, or six hundred dollars a month, and then in order for their insurance to start working, they have to pay three thousand, five thousand, in some cases. $7,000 out of pocket as a deductible before the plan begins to take effect. And that has left a lot of people with a sour taste in their mouth and an inability to actually access the system. The other parts of the Affordable Care Act, including some of the benefit components, are, are really things that most Americans want. Being able to have their children on a plan until age 26, eliminating pre-existing conditions, uh, having no cancellation provisions in the plan, uh, having... Um, as, as, as President-elect Trump has said, opening the marketplace to overseas drug prescriptions is something that has been long overdue and limiting the pharmaceutical companies and what they can charge. So, doctor, is it your prediction that in the end we will likely keep some of those things that you say that most people agree upon but get rid of the uh, individual mandate uh, and, and take that out of the mix? I think the mandate's going to go. Uh, but it's going to have to be replaced with something that protects the millions of people who are either being subsidized or who still rely on being able to purchase care, but not purchase benefits that simply give them a ticket that they can't get on the ride with. I, but that is, if you take away the individual mandate, does, is, is it like dominoes and the whole system is going to collapse underneath it? Not necessarily. Again, many of the people who purchase not who are given the subsidies. There's a difference. We subsidize millions of people who don't have to pay a premium, and they have access the same way that people have had access through Medicaid and, and community health centers over the years. But for many of the millions of people who actually purchase it as individuals or whose employers don't provide it and the employer is too small and they must purchase it, they find that the premiums are increasing and the cost share, the deductible they have to pay before they can actually use the darn thing is prohibitive. We can fix those things. It's going to require some actuarial manipulation and some careful thinking. And I, I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic that we can and we, will. we have opened the door to the Affordable Care Act. All right, Dr. Wilson, we'll have to leave it there, and we appreciate your time tonight. When we return, we'll take a look at uh, more about the Affordable Health Care uh, debate with our roundtable. Welcome back. So how much has the Affordable Health Care Act changed health care in the United States since it was enacted by President Obama in 2010? As of the le end of last enrollment period, 12.7 million Americans are enrolled through the marketplace, including one and a half million Floridians. Provisions in the law, such as allowing dependents to stay on their parents' plan until 26, has helped roughly 20 million Americans get coverage. The national uninsured rate is now at an all-time low of 8.6 percent down for more than 16% in 2010. On the other hand, premiums are set to rise a staggering 
22% next year alone. And joining us for more on the uncertain future of Obamacare is Jim Larkin, a volunteer counselor with Serving Health Insurance Needs of Elders, or SHINE, Sarasota Healthcare Attorney Ronald Chapman, and Reverend Russell Meyer, the Executive Director of the Florida Council of uh, Churches. And, and Ronald, I want to start with you, because when you look at some of these numbers, that the uninsured rate is now at an all-time low of 8.6%, uh, uh, that seems pretty good. Well, it is good. I mean, getting the uninsured rate down to zero is what we ultimately want to do. The problem is the cost of doing that has been staggering. The cost of health care premiums, the cost of health care alone. We were told that with Obamacare, the trajectory of health care would go down and things would be less expensive. They're not less expensive. They're significantly more expensive. But isn't the level or the rate of health care premium increases slowed since it, it uh, came onto the marketplace? I don't believe it's slowed since it came out of the marketplace. Today, you're 22%. Some places had 100% increase in their premiums. When you add on to the premium, the deductible that people have to pay, for most people, health care is unaffordable. And most employers that were um, providing health care to their employees have now pushed a significant amount of that cost back onto their employees, which never happened before. Reverend Meyer, you, you, you have heard uh, the criticisms of Obamacare, especially during the recently concluded presidential campaign. Uh, and it's, it's a complicated explanation to explain the way the premium increases. Well, if we look at the five years before the uh, Affordable Care Act went into play, the average rate of increase of cost year to year uh, was over 10 percent. Some years it was nine, some years it was uh, pushing 13, 14 percent. Since the Affordable Care Act went into play up until this year, the average rate of increase was half that. Um, and, th and those are numbers that the Kaiser Family Foundation that specializes in health care, a number of people have uh, noted that. And so what we're seeing this particular year for a particular cohort is a sudden catch up in uh, rate increases. And it's the one part of the insurance market where the big insurers can, can really do something without pushback. When you have a large corporate buyer, they can push back on it. And, and despite all this political talk about the, the merits or the, the, the problems with Obamacare, people are still signing up, in fact, in numbers uh, you know, faster and, and more than in the years past. And I know, uh, Jim, uh, you deal with Medicare enrollment, uh, but you, you, you hear the stories about the Obamacare enrollment. It is up. It is up, uh, but uh, I don't see how it really has improved the uh, overall health care situation. In, in the what country. way? Uh, there are still pockets that we get here, in, even in Sarasota, of under, under, underinsured and uninsured people. They just don't understand the uh, difficulties with this act. Right. It is. Uh, it is at times incomprehensible. And maybe that's one of the big problems with it. We're going to have to take a quick break, but we'll have much more with our roundtable coming up yes. after this. Welcome back. If you are just joining us, we are discussing Obamacare and what could happen if it is repealed under the Trump administration. And our guest tonight are Jim Larkin, a volunteer counselor with Shine Healthcare, attorney Ronald Chapman, and Reverend Russell Meyer, the executive director of the Florida Council of Churches. Uh, we were talking during the break. Uh, about some of the issues that, that caused uh, the criticism of uh, the, the Health Care Act, but the, the criticism started even before the, uh, the law went into effect. But, Ronald, if you could talk about some of the major problems with this law uh, and, and, and how it has not worked as it many hoped it would be. Well, I think a couple of the major problems, one of the first ones is the um, mandate. The mandate was initially there, and the mandate's necessary for any insurance pool in order to pull in the healthy people. You need the healthy people to pay the premiums, young the young people, or just the healthy people, to pay premiums and not to use those dollars. So those dollars can be used for the elderly, for people that are sick, people that have pre-existing conditions, all these kinds of things. We took that bottom out. We never enforced the mandate, and I don't even think the mandate's constitutional, even though the Supreme Court said, you know, it's not a tax and, and you can do these kinds of things. But you remove that. And then you added on top of that to the insurance carriers that you eliminate pre-existing conditions. So now the, the sickest people are provided insurance. And then on top of that, you added 26-year-olds. You can keep them. Somebody has to pay for that. 
Um, and then on top of that, you allow the insurance companies to adjust their premiums. So they're adjusting premiums and they're adding co-pays. So what happens is a family has to pay $1,000 a month for insurance, and then they get hit with a seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000, whatever it is, um, a deductible. So in effect, you're adding to $10,000 to them, and employers are pushing money back. So it's becoming a completely unaffordable system. But before the health care uh, act went into effect, you had situations where people were who with serious illnesses were running out of health insurance. These were things that Americans railed against and blamed the insurance industry for. It, to some degree, have we not solved some of those problems? I don't think you solve many of those problems because you have a lot of people that are going now uninsured because they can't afford the insurance that they're supposed to be able to afford. But I do agree with you. We have people that, are pre or people that have a significant health concerns that should be able to have those. As the Reverend said when we were break, we're an industrialized society that doesn't afford health care to our people. Now, I don't think we should do that uh, as a government benefit, but there are mechanisms, and, and President-elect Trump has added some of those benefits or advocated for some of those, which we can talk about. Reverend Meyer, I, I know you, you look at this issue as a, in, in, from a moral perspective and uh, yes. uh, that it, it is something that we need to do, but it, make no mistake about it, uh, the premiums have gone up, uh, that not enough healthy young people have joined uh, these pools, and that has caused a problem which opponents of Obamacare have centered on, and it has resonated with voters. Well, it, it does resonate because you can easily pull out some uh, high uh, value kind of stories that really grab the attention and, and uh, lose the larger macroeconomic argument. Uh, something had to be done. Our health care costs were uh, uh, running away with the budget. And so, um, so what the Affordable Care Act has done is helped reduce the deficit and a number of other things. Um, we have this basic problem in the society that we decided that the employer bared all of the onus for health care as a benefit for working. Um, a lot of uh, Detroit moved to Mexico and elsewhere because of the health insurance portion of this. Uh, our, our belief that the employer should be the first place where we find our health care has been at issue in our economics for 30 or 40 years now. Um, we haven't figured that part out um, as... Um, as we've noted here already, we have to find a way to get everybody in the game to make the numbers work. You know, uh, Jim, you spend a lot of time uh, signing people up for, for Medicare. Right. There, is dis there are two debates. Um, some people say the better uh, way to go would be Medicare for all. Uh, other people are saying that even Medicare now is not sustainable, and I heard uh, discussions on Capitol Hill today that even that has to uh, be cut back. It, it may be means-tested or age-tested. Uh, that is not stopping people from signing up, though. No, it isn't. Uh, and right now it is means-tested for, for a lot of people that uh, make more than a certain level of uh, income. They have to pay more in premiums. and for. Uh, for their Part B and their Part D plans, uh, so that exists already. Um, yes, there is uh, the Medicare trust fund, and I say that facetiously, is in, in trouble and may run out of money at the distant future, but uh, we'll continue to uh, work to cover everybody that we can. So, so where do we go here? I mean, are, are we, we've been talking earlier in this broadcast about are we gonna kick 20, people, 20 million people who currently have health insurance through Obamacare off it altogether. I mean, what do you think uh, the, the Congress and the new president is going to do? Well, I think the first thing is they're not going to kick anybody off. They're not going to take away somebody's insurance that has it. But we have a moral dilemma in this country, and that is most people have a third party paying their insurance. They're not vested in the cost of their insurance, and they either misuse or they use services that are not necessary. We need to invest or, or invest with the insured. 
the ability to cost compare, the ability to shop prices, the ability to be their own advocate to obtain the lowest possible price. When you do that, you will force the cost of health care down somewhat. You'll bend this curve even more. And you're right. We have 20, 25 million people that are uninsured, 30 million if you add in the 8.6 that are uninsured. They need to have some protection. We shouldn't be the only industrialized country that doesn't protect them. But to protect them isn't at the cost and expense of everybody else. And we need to invest in people the ability to shop. Reverend Mayor, your, your prediction, well, is this going to continue just to be a political issue where, where it's two sides clashing in that, that regard, or are we going to find uh, a solution somewhere in the middle here? I don't think the we'll see a solution in the middle. I think with the appointments that are being announced now, looking at the work that they've done, uh, Obamacare will become Ryan Care. Um, we're going to see the mandate go away. We're going to see any limits on state markets lifted. Uh, we're going to actually see a, a push to change Medicare into Ryan Care. We're going to see people being given some kind of allotment for what your medical care uh, uh, support will be and then you go out on the open marketplace and you try and find something that matches it. And, and so the, and the, and the, oh, Medicare will become Obamacare. Jim, are the people that you deal with on a daily basis, are they prepared for that? Uh, I don't think so, Alan. Uh, uh, I'm, having, I'm more and more of an educator with each year, uh, with people coming up. Uh, the biggest cohort in this country is coming into age 65 and older. So that's going to continue. Uh, so I'm going to still have to educate people Ron, from now on. We have less than a minute left, but Ron, uh, what do you think is going to happen first? Well, I think there could be some major changes. I don't know that there's a political will to actually completely repeal unless they change. We need 60 votes well, if, in the Senate you, in order to do that. If you watch some of the, the Trump rallies well, or the other, during the primary system, there, there seemed to be a lot of political will well, I would there. prefer that that happen, but I think there will be other things that will happen, too. You'll have um, health care savings accounts that will come in. You will have um, individuals to be able to deduct their premiums and to deduct their health care costs. You will empower the consumer. And you will widen up, the, you will open the borders. All right, let's take one more break. And when we come back, we'll get final thoughts from our guests, as well as what some of our viewers are saying about VA benefits, a story that we did last night, VA uh, veterans who are impacted by Agent Orange. Stay with us. Welcome back. President-elect Donald Trump says he plans to keep the good parts of the Affordable Health Care Act while repealing the rest. His appointment of fierce Obamacare opponent Congressman Tom Price as Health and Human Services Secretary today suggests he'll follow through on that promise. Our guests join us right now with what that means for Americans. And Reverend Meyer, are, are we going to end this process in a place better than we were before the Affordable Health Care Act? That's a great question, uh, Alan, because it depends on your definition of good. And so the definition of good being used here is one of, that makes the marketplace work well, not necessarily means every American who needs the best of care gets that delivered to them. Would you agree with that? I agree with parts of that, but not totally. I think you need to free up the market. I need, think you need to allow insurance to be sold across state lines. You need to allow to reduce drug prices. You need to allow foreign uh, markets to come in and sell those drugs at a reduced price if they're safe. And you need to allow people to deduct it from their taxes. I don't think President Trump, President-elect Trump, plans on disenfranchising a whole group of people that have insurance. But we need to in make them be invested in the marketplace to reduce the cost. But that is a complicated thing to sure. do. And people, who understands it? Uh, well, there's a large group of people for who that is just never going to happen. They don't. That for whatever reasons, their capacities for doing that don't exist. And, and Jim, when you, you're talking about picking plans, even as it is today, that's a very complicated thing to do. And, and most Americans, I, I dare say, don't understand what they're looking at. That's correct, which is why I said that I am more, more and more becoming an educator on these things for the people. I, I don't make the choices for them. They have to make the choices for themselves. The only way they'll be satisfied. So there needs to be more education there is at the Medicare level because it's a little simpler than the Affordable Care Act and uh, Obamacare level there needs to be a lot more education of the consumer 
okay. going forward. We'll have to leave it there, but before we go, we want to share what some of our viewers are saying about last night's topic. A new study by the Veterans Administration is drawing a link between exposure to Agent Orange and high blood pressure. That means mm -hmm. thousands of more veterans from Vietnam and Korea could be eligible for benefits, yet one group is still being ignored. Blue Water Navy veterans. They may have climbed over planes covered in the defoliant, but since they were never on the mainland, they can't receive benefits. And here's what some of you are saying. Tina Pickering writes, I think it's a disgrace. I am a proud American, but this makes me ashamed of my government. Veterans before all others, without them, there would be no freedom to enjoy. Margaret Goodwin writes, typical vets are still being regarded as collateral damage and it needs to stop. And Robert Rubelon writes, if you can't take care of our soldiers, don't send them to war. If you'd like to join the conversation about tonight's topic, just visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash news at 7. And FYI, want to watch past roundtable discussions? They're available on Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Roku. Thank you for all our guests for being here tonight. Jim Larkin is a volunteer counselor with Shine. Ronald Chapman is healthcare attorney and owner of Chapman Law Group. And Reverend Russell Meyer is the executive director of the Florida Council of Churches.